Okay, um, so I want you all to imagine this. You wake up in the morning and you check your phone and uh, it's not for the usual, you know, checking your socials or um, replying to your messages or uh, even, you know, looking at your emails. It is to check the air quality. And uh, you see it's a perfectly sunny weather outside, but when you check the air quality report on your phone, you see that the air quality along with the ozone um, level is quite high. So much so that you had to reach out for your specially designed mask, a gas mask, which will help you go out in the morning. Now, this is the year 2050, and it's already too late to make any changes. And that is a scenario that we should be worried about. From New York to New Delhi, air quality problem, the air pollution is uh, you know, evident everywhere. It affects the quality of life for billions of people. The UN has declared clean air and a healthy environment as a human right. So will the governments be taking up and how, how, is, it, how is it possible or even um, you know, acceptable for, for expecting all governments to balance economic growth, progress, along with uh, maintaining a good air quality? Can we expect, how, what can we expect from them to mitigate our changing climate? Um, who pays for the damage? Is it the countries which polluted the most or is it our lungs? We want to know whether, uh, you know, like, because history teaches us the environmental impact of energy use is almost always an afterthought. So the current climate crisis was not inevitable. It was a coordinated push by the fossil fuel industry combined with the myopic and underwhelming political leadership. All these stunted these early attempts to save the planet. We're still not far away there to a sustainable future. It requires major shift in the way we do almost everything. Uh, starting from you know, uh, going, local going for local solutions with global support and technological know-how, not believing that economic growth is not in tandem with uh, you know, environmental, um, and, uh, I mean, taking care of the environment, uh, creating market prices for nature, providing economic incentives for the marginalized population, changing our consumption pattern, and many more. Now, we all know this, and we have been hearing it for decades now. Are we today where we need to be? Uh, you know, we had a lot of climate, uh, uh, you know, conversations last year at the Kigali as well. Did we reach all the goals that we were planning to? Uh, we want to hear from the experts from four nations who are at the forefront of this crisis. And to begin that, without any gender bias, I would like to start with Sunur first. Sunur, my first question to you is, what are the primary, because you were, you were a practicing surgeon before becoming a, a you know, policy advocate, my, my specific question to you will be uh, the human costs, you know, the human health costs of air pollution. If you could start with that and then maybe lead us to um, the gender aspects of it, whether, whether it is gendered or not, and uh, maybe uh, also add quick and practical policies, that policy changes, reforms that we can make right away. So over to you. So the introduction that Parissa mentioned, that you wake up in the morning and you look at the quality of air, and that is why the public and citizens are so frustrated with all these monitors and advocacy campaigns around air pollution, because there's an overwhelming sense of helplessness. Breathing is an involuntary act. The citizens ask, so should I stop breathing because the air is bad? Some of, some of us have some protection mechanisms, but many don't. They don't have the option of sitting at home and not going to work. They don't have the option of sitting in an air-conditioned car. They are on two-wheelers. They are walking. So air pollution today is making us sick. It is making us poor. And it is making us starve. Often the perception is that Air pollution is something that impacts the respiratory system, but that is not the case. It also has a much wider impact, whether it is heart attacks, whether it is strokes. In fact, today, breathing is more dangerous for us than not doing exercise, than having a poor diet, or consuming tobacco. So worldwide, six million people die every year from tobacco-related causes. Seven million die due to air pollution. 
So air pollution is a public health emergency. I would go as far as saying this, because Ambassador Chinoy is sitting right in front of me, that it is a national security threat for countries. Those of us who believe that health is a soft issue, we need to also look at the economic side of it. 8% of India's GDP, 10% of China's GDP is reduced due to air pollution. Starvation. Fifth of India's wheat production is damaged due to air pollution. 3% of India's rice production is damaged due to air pollution. Another vis invisible aspect of air pollution are children because they cannot vote. So we don't address them. They are not our voters yet. However, the impact on children on the development of the lungs and the brains is very significant. In fact, pathoanatomists have found evidence of soot in mother's placenta. So an unborn child is already impacted by air pollution. Now, coming to the question of what can be done, what are the quick gains? So my sense is one that we need to acknowledge that we are resource constrained. So we cannot turn into hamsters going behind every new term that is launched in Geneva or Washington DC and become experts on that and launch those courses at our universities and at our think tanks. We need to do a triage of what we can do and what we can't. Pooling of resources is critical. We need to have regional technology hubs where regional members share the resources. These are lessons we learned from COVID, but these are very much needed for fighting air pollution. In places like Geneva, so there's the website of the UN in Geneva. If you look there, there's a blue book of diplomatic missions in Geneva, which lists all diplomatic missions and their staff. Compare India's mission to that of Denmark. Compare Indonesia's mission to that of Sweden. Compare Pakistan's mission to that of Switzerland. The smaller, richer countries have at least eight to nine attaches covering the various UN agencies in Geneva. The big, poor countries, we have two to three attaches. Physically, humanly, it's impossible to cover all bases. We need to have a mechanism, since this forum is going to make recommendations to the G20, we need to pool our technical attaches at policy centers like Geneva and Washington, DC. Instead of having our officers copy-paste from other reports, we need to be a part of that conversation. Second is, we need to demonopolize air pollution from the ministries of health and ministries of environment. As technical agencies who provide us with the evidence and update the evidence, that's fine. But in the food chain, we all know that the ministries of health and ministries of environment are not influential enough. And this is a public health emergency. So shifting air pollution as an issue to the prime minister's office and having a strong diplomat, strong negotiator head that agency would be very important and would bear some results. The third issue is the complete absence of women from the decision-making table on air pollution. Now, the impact of air pollution is disproportionately high on the girl, child, and women, especially in South Asia. And the reasons are well known. So there needs to be a strong focus by the influential and powerful men sitting in this room to ensure that at least 50% participation at the decision-making table is guaranteed to women representatives. In terms of how we move forward, I think it is critical that we move away from the question of what. What has been debated extensively, the evidence is all there. Now is the time to move into the action gear and start working on how to move the agenda forward. Back to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to come back to Juliet to, to, um, to respond to um, how we need to, uh, I mean, if we are mainstreaming, um, you know, like uh, the climate change issues away from um, the environment uh, ministries, how do you feel about it? But that's, that's for later. Uh, now I would like to ask Sonam 
Um, how is dealing with air pollution different for the global south? If you could, if you could tell us how, uh, how, how it's different in terms of um, uh, you know, the, the tactics that we need to use and, and the lessons that we have. And also, uh, what do you feel about um, having progress without pollution? Is that possible? Is that feasible? Is that, is that something that you have been observing or, or, or that's something that we can hope for the future? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel. I'm Sonam Myung Chen, and I'm a health systems researcher based in Bhutan. Uh, Bhutan is a small Himalayan country in Southeast Asia. And uh, to answer your question, I'll speak from the perspective of health researcher and uh, how uh, air pollution and the environmental determinants of health affects human health. Uh, so as highlighted by Dr. Verma a while ago, um, Air pollution actually causes, alone causes 7 million preventable deaths per year, uh, with more than 90% of people uh, breathing polluted air, and almost 3,000 million people are still depending on polluting fuels, such as solid fuels or kerosene for lighting, cooking, and heating uh, in our part of the world, in Southeast Asia. And, uh, and uh, let me begin with some of the statistics. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, 98% of cities in developing countries with over 100,000 inhabitants fail to meet the WHO air quality guidelines. And in developed countries, the difference, uh, however, that applies to only 56% of the cities. And in addition, 90% of air pollution related deaths occur in low and middle income countries, of which approximately two out of three take place in Southeast Asia and Western Pacific regions. So now the reason for this disparity, uh, so uh, Dr. Verma also highlighted some of the disparities. It's mainly, what I feel is mainly due to the differences in government actions and also the financial resources, obviously. Uh, like low middle income countries tend to have less regulations regarding air quality and vehicle emissions. Uh, still, uh, currently, coal power plants are prevalent due to industrialization in developing countries. And in big cities in developing countries, it's mostly the poor people who live in cramped uh, informal settlements, often near the rubbish dumps, who, uh, uh, who feel the most brunt of the air pollution. And of course, there has been substantial effects, uh, despite substantial effects of air pollution on the public health, uh, what is lacking currently is that health policymakers and researchers rarely uh, consider how to reduce, mitigate, or respond to these issues due to the complexity and the need for multi-sectoral collaboration to take action. So mitigating air pollution is a complex issue. And uh, there's need for large-scale changes. Uh, currently, there's large-scale changes that societies are continuing to experience, including increasing needs uh, for energy, transport, and technological innovation. And seldom health is rarely central to these decisions affecting these development trends. That's one of the issues resulting in missed opportunities for health protection and promotion. And globally, our current governance mechanisms, including those at the local and national level, are failing to deal effectively with cross-cutting nature of the environmental health issues. And coming to the global initiatives, the World Health Organization has in place a global strategy on health, environment, and climate change, the transformation needed to improve lives and well-being sustainably through healthy environments. Uh, whereby all WHO member states have agreed to this, uh, agreed to implement this strategy. Uh, this strategy actually aims to provide a vision and way forward on how the world and its health community need to respond to environmental health risks and challenges until the year 2030, and to ensure safe, enabling, and equitable environment for health by transforming our way of living, working, producing, Consuming and governing. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I will have to just um, ask you to also uh, help us understand whether uh, it is possible to have uh, progress or, or yes, uh, industrialization yes. With, so, uh, without affecting the environment. Or uh, It is that's... possible because as of now, there's substantial transitions in energy, transport, and other major systems are underway, uh, which should lead to profound impacts on population health. So 
of course, there is a positive uh, transformation. And then for that, a wider societal, intersectoral, as I mentioned, more holistic and population-based uh, approach is needed. Um, and, uh, but as you said, we mainly need funds. We need funds, right? Yes, yes. That's uh, what we need most. We are definitely making an advance, mm -hmm. but of course, there, we do have a lot of challenges. And uh, in terms of moving towards, do I, do I still have time? Yeah, just a, a minute or two, it would be great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of moving towards healthier societies without air pollution, requires greater po uh, focus on politics and political economy, as high, we discussed that before as well, and a broader paradigm shift to redistribute power. So now, uh, Talking of uh, political will and action for pol political will, this can only come through broad societal awareness of fundamental health threats. So uh, there has been a lot of advocacy and a lot of talks going on. So there has been advancement. And individual advocates, health professionals, civil society, researchers are crucial for, mobilize, uh, for mobilizing public support for more sustainable and health promoting development choices. So that's thank you so yeah, much, thank Sonam. You. That thank you so much. Uh, that, that highlighted on, on a lot of points. Now, uh, without further ado, I would like to move to Shaley, if that's okay. Shaley, I wanted to ask you uh, the linkages between the SDGs and pollution abatement. If you could enlighten us on that matter um, from your research. Yeah, uh, uh, a very very good afternoon to all of you, and thank you so much for your question. Uh, so the the overarching question uh, on progress, you know, whether progress is possible. Um, uh, so, so uh, of course, uh, progress is one of the key P's of uh, sustainable development goals out of the five P's. And uh, we very much heard about the health implications from uh, my previous two speakers. Uh, but also when we uh, talk about pure economics of it, uh, you know, like my organization, Terry, we have undertaken a study. And uh, if we just look at purely from a very economic perspective, although it's not a very uh, desirable perspective, because there are so many things which you can't monetize, but nonetheless, you know, uh, for decision making. Uh, so, so the benefits to cost ratio of taking, for instance, air pollution measures in a city like Delhi is more than two. That means uh, the cost of benefits definitely outweigh the costs of uh, taking, uh, you know, measures to abate air pollution. So definitely progress is possible, uh, you know, while addressing environmental quality. And of course, this has been a perpetual question in the sustainable development uh, narrative. If we look at the SDGs, uh, air pollution directly features in three SDGs, which is SDG 3 health, and my previous panelists already referred to that. Also SDG 11, which is on cities and SDG 12. Uh, one of the things about air pollution is often it is a very anthropocentric viewpoint that we take uh, even as researchers. But now the uh, debate is broadening. So for instance, if we look at SDG 13, that's climate change, and we look at the aspect of uh, short-lived climate pollutants, and uh, they cause, they, while they are there in the atmosphere for a very short time, they account for 45% of the global warming. So for instance, SDG is not necessarily a very perfect framework. So for instance, there's no um, you know, real uh, measurable indicator, or time-bound measurable indicator on short-lived climate pollutants, for instance, which requires international uh, cooperation, but nonetheless very important for human health, but also planetary health. So that would be on SDGs. Wonderful. And uh, given that we all know, um, you know, 21 out of 30 uh, most polluted, uh, air, air polluted cities in the world are in India. I wanted to know um, your take on um, how, 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 you know, how efficiently is India dealing with the issue of air pollution and what are, what, what are the spaces that we still need to think about? Yes, yeah, so India has, uh, is, uh, has a lot of policy frameworks, regulatory frameworks on air pollution going back to 1981, where we had the Air Pollution uh, Monitoring and Control Act, followed by the Environmental uh, Protection Act of 1986, and I can go on and on. Uh, but, you know, of course, the implementation is where the key is. Um, in 2019, uh, like in India, uh, India launched the National uh, Clean Air Program, uh, and for the very first time, it had like time-bound, quantified targets for the next five years. Uh, and of course, this was focused more on the non-attainment cities, cities which didn't really meet their um, 
air pollution uh, you know, criteria according to the national air quality standards. And uh, so there, is, there, there are initiatives in India, but then still uh, there, is a, there is a long way to go. Um, considering that you know, different cities have different challenges, considering the sources of air pollution, and uh, towards that, while in most uh, developing countries uh, and countries in the global south, we have a very comprehensive network to, I mean, it's growing more comprehensive to uh, monitor pollutants like sulfur dioxide, NOx, uh, of course, the, the particulate matters 2.5 and, uh, you know, 2.10. But then, for instance, you know, it could be further strengthened to, uh, to kind of uh, include more pollutants like the short-lived uh, climate pollutants. Also, there aren't enough source apportionment studies. Uh, so this is a capacity which needs to be strengthened because unless and until you know what the sources are, you cannot design those interventions. So of course, that is now uh, in India being dealt with. So at the city level, uh, cities have to come up with their clean action plans, conduct source apportionment studies. So for instance, I come from New Delhi, uh, which is also you know one of the most uh, polluted country. And the sources in different seasons vary. Uh, so in winters, for instance, uh, you have transport as number one, industry at number two, and um, you know, uh, agriculture stubble burning at number three. Uh, but uh, in summers, the sources are different. It's industry at number one, transportation at number two, and you know, agriculture is relatively less. So, uh, so, so that capacity you know, is slowly being built, but it needs to be further strengthened. Um, also, I would say like um, uh, that you know the uh, impact of existing interventions. That's something that uh, uh, that is, that should be measured. Another experiment in India is this air air shed approach because uh, because often air is in a federal country like India. Uh, it's it's not uh, an issue which can be dealt necessarily by a single city. It needs cooperation between different federal units and perhaps even different countries. So, so that is where you know uh, we would like uh, India, but also you know global South countries to go. Thank you. And do you feel budgetary requirements are sufficient, or it needs to be increased, or? Yeah. So as was uh, highlighted by Sunur, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the value chain, uh, and the, you know, so the budgetary allocations, as such, for the Environment Ministry is very less, and uh, the um, uh, federal units. Uh, it's also less. Uh, although I would like to highlight one more thing for India, uh, the Finance Commission of India, which is responsible to uh, div divide the revenues uh, across states, has now, uh, since well, 2009, has put air quality as one of the criteria uh, to so that you know states who are better performing or cities who are better performing in air pollution, they can get more money. So actually, it's an incentive mechanism. But having said that, like you know, there is definitely need for more financial resources. Okay, so that's a common theme between, um, you know, both the countries that we have covered uh, in, the, in the last uh, few minutes. Um, now I would like to come to Juliet, if that's okay. Juliet, I wanted to know, um, I mean, first of all, I want to express that it's my first time in uh, Rwanda, and um, how beautiful is Rwanda, the air? I mean, do you, f do you all feel it? Because I come from a city which is uh, pretty polluted. Um, Dhaka is one of the most polluted in the, in the world, and, and breathing here has been different for the last one and a half days. So, uh, you know, like, I hope Kigali really maintains this, and it's, it's it become my personal agenda to, to see to it that, you know, Kigali is doing well. So, um, congratulations on that. And I wanted to know um, how you feel Rwanda has been dealing with the issue of air pollution, and, and what are the scopes that, uh, that, yet, that are yet to be, you know, uh, actualized. So, if you could highlight on that. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Um, my president should learn that you appreciated the air quality because, <laughs> because the push on uh, how to get it better is really, really hard, especially when we are watching the news and CNN is projecting these indices on different cities. And you're like, how, why is the air quality in Rwanda rated, you know, red, maroon, why isn't it in green? And, and you have a whole lot of explanations on us being in summer, the, the wind, and so on. But uh, enough of that, there is still a lot to be done. And uh, Doctor, it breaks my heart to learn what you just expressed, how 
disproportionately the women are affected, the children are affected. Uh, it's the same that we saw in the in the research that we made in 2017 here in Rwanda. Uh, only in 2017 we noticed around 8% of premature deaths associated with um, um, respiratory diseases that are again associated to uh, poor air quality. So uh, th that again, out of the 8%, the, the huge percentage is around the, the young, the, the kids below five years of age. Uh, and it, it makes me at least as a policymaker or an implementer of the, the different regulations and policies see that there is still a lot to be done. So uh, a lot of legal instruments have been developed, the Clean Air Act, law and environment, and there are specific asks on what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And again, we know the main sources of pol air pollutants are from in urban areas, it's from vehicular emissions, and in the rural areas, it's from uh, use of biomass for cooking. So uh, basing on that, different action, uh, policy actions have been taken, are being implemented, but it, the pace is not uh, as, as it should be. Um, we are promoting the use of uh, alternatives to, to vehicles, like the roads that are being constructed right now. We're encouraging having walkways, having bicycle lanes. So we have uh, different options so we can reduce on the vehicles on the road. Again, we are promoting the, the, the like buses, use of this uh, discouragement of uh, individual vehicles. Uh, we have also waived the tax on electric vehicles. If you're bringing in electric, an electric vehicle, it's, it's imported uh, free of tax. Some are being assembled here in, in Rwanda and they are, there is a, a specific incentive on this in order to reduce the dependence on fossil, uh, on, on fossil fuel. Again, that said, I think we, were, we are, I come from the Environment Regulatory Authority and uh, people know sometimes, uh, know us as those who criticize whatever is being done, but this, this time it's real. The quality of the fuel that we have is not, is not really good. It's, uh, it's low sulfur, yes, but we need another premium type of fuel so we can get uh, better and better cars on the road. Uh, we have uh, um, air quality standards and uh, it's Euro 4 at the moment, but we have not successfully uh, met the requirements of, of, of the fuel that can lead us to uh, 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 complying with the Euro 4 requirements. So we are able to test in the roadworthiness tests. Everyone who has a vehicle has to conduct a roadworthiness test of their vehicle. And air quality uh, is one of the parameters that are tested. We are testing uh, carbon monoxide, sulfur, dioxide, NOx. Uh, there are four parameters that we test. And if you're not complying with any of those four, you're required to go do some maintenance and then come back so you don't have a roadworthiness test certificate to ride on the road. We are also uh, encouraging the traffic officers to have more uh, mobile testers, just the way they have those for, you know, testing if you're, ride, if you're driving with alcohol. <laughs> yeah, so we have uh, managed to purchase a few, but we still need a lot. So saying all this to, to, to really emphasize the fact that it cannot be uh, a game of the Ministry of Environment or the Environmental Authority or the Ministry of Health, we need to involve all these players. Even when the, we have the Rwanda National Police conducting these uh, roadworthiness tests, we, we, th we, we think they're not doing the job correct. And now we are coming in with a, a service provider, an independent service provider, who is going to provide those services of testing the air quality. Uh, so they have more, uh, the, the machines are calibrated, the service is done purposely focusing on the air quality. And uh, basically let doctors be doctors, let's not have the police be able to uh, go into the testing of air quality of, of uh, 
of, of vehicles. So that said, we are, we are also really pushing so hard to reduce the dependency of uh, use of biomass for cooking, especially in the rural areas. Uh, we are promoting cleaner fuels for cooking. Uh, we have methane gas, for those who uh, know a little more about Rwanda, we have a lake that has methane gas and uh, uh, it's, it's now being uh, exploited. Uh, soon we shall start getting it into canisters that can be used for cooking, this, um, supplied across the country, so we can reduce the use of charcoal and, and firewood for cooking, which is otherwise the biggest source of uh, uh, pollution in the rural areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're running a little short of time, so I would like all, um, uh, all my panelists to think about a question while I take questions from the audience as well. And that common question is, um, how can we, from the Global South, get together to accumulate financing for climate? And, and, and how can uh, the G20 presidency or uh, any other or, you know, I mean, association that we have be useful in, in, in getting the Global South together to, to, to gather the climate financing we need in order to clean our air? Because that's, that's something that uh, we will be needing at any point, uh, despite the levels of monitoring that we have or the data collection levels that we have. We do need finances to clean the air. It's possible uh, with the finance. So I would like each of you to think about it while I take questions from the audience. Um, from the audience, may I please request uh, if you have a question to come uh, towards the mic that is here, and uh, please ask your question by telling your uh, by telling us your name and affiliation, and uh, to keep the questions brief if that's possible. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ravi Pokhana. I'm the executive director at uh, a think tank uh, called Pehle India Foundation. My question is for Shelley. Uh, there's a movement going on in India about uh, battery run or electric uh, vehicles. How, uh, how much do you think would it contribute? What is the status currently and how much do you think would it contribute to the uh, agenda that we are discussing today? Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hi, my name is uh, Archie Adil and I'm a senior manager at Microsafe Consulting. My question is to Juliet. I just heard you were talking about unclean cooking and uh, I just want to understand what are some of the barriers beyond affordability? Why canisters have not yet been uh, adopted? And are there any behavioral reasons also that you've noticed or you foresee? Okay, if we don't have any questions at this point, um, I would like um, two of you to take the questions, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah okay, thank you so much for your question. So, uh, as you would know, in India, you know, there is this um, scheme called FAME, Faster Adoption and Manufacturing of Electric Vehicles. So, transportation is definitely a, a very big source of air pollution. Uh, in, in terms of, like, you know, uh, while uh, there is a rollout of the scheme, uh, you know, we would know that, like, um, in India, for instance, uh, at the individual level is still not affordable, like even for an individual like me. But, uh, but for instance, if we look at public agencies and we look at the policy innovation of uh, procurement, public procurement, which, uh, which is um, uh, very much uh, there in all countries and India has gone uh, towards digitization of public procurement, uh, what at least, because if you, if you look at just like the LED story of India, you know, it really did kickstart because, you know, the, the government started procuring it and then therefore the markets responded and slowly the prices came down. So very recently in India, um, you know, in, in at least the intra-city transport, it is uh, being encouraged uh, that public agencies procure electric vehicles so that, you know, then it has a sort of a snowballing effect on the market. Uh, but yeah, having said that, the progress definitely is uh, not to the extent any, uh, you know, which we would want to be. So even if you go, for example, by the CNG experience, you know, which was considered uh, the clean, clean source of transport before, uh, which is still considered in many ways, but if you look at the infrastructure constraints of the CNG network, so, so, so do the electric vehicle um, faces, you know, the similar challenge, uh, it faces similar challenges of the infrastructure charging stations yeah yes yeah. so the charging station so that so that is somewhere you know which um, you know we, we you know it it remains to be seen but i do think that there are encouraging signs um, you know and and we'll see thank you 
Thank you, Julian. I think you'll agree with the with, this, uh, with the, the fact that electric vehicles, even after making it tax-free, is very expensive for a lot of people in in, in Rwanda. I mean, um, given what I've uh, you know like understood, there is a big income gap, and 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 affording an electric car is is still uh, like. Uh, like, like a, a very big luxury for a lot of people in Rwanda. So uh, if you could, uh, I mean, also shed some light on that and then uh, answer the question about uh, the use of, um, can I get the non-use of canisters, whether it's a behavioral uh, change or not. Sure, sure. Electric vehicles are still expensive. And uh, I think it's true to all new technology. And we believe that as time goes on, um, uh, when we have more on the market, then they could uh, reduce in the cost. But like doctor said, what can we do? If, if I'm government, uh, some, gov some government offices have a little more money than you know, individuals have to spend on a vehicle, for instance. It would be a very good if the prime minister's office, for instance, just chooses to ride in an electric vehicle. It's not an issue of cost there. It's an issue of uh, prioritizing that this is important. I think, uh, yes, they are still a little expensive for us, but our government, uh, and government is the biggest uh, procuring entity in many countries. So if we can shift to green procurement, that would make a statement uh, that this is the way to go. And then on clean cooking, uh, it's largely a cost issue. Uh, yes, some little behavior, uh, uh, behavior issues around it, but the, the upfront cost to buy a cooker, to buy all the cylinders, is what is preventing the shift uh, to the use of, 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 uh, of LPG. Uh, yes, it's not 100% clean, but comparatively, it's uh, cleaner compared to, to charcoal. And then the behavior part of it is, uh, some people still believe that you, you have to you know, you, you have to roast your maize in, in, in this particular way. You have to cook particular food in this particular way. But that, that, can, but that we can get around through education and awareness raising. But we seriously need incentives or yeah, some sources of funds where uh, our families can, can go and get soft loans to be able to purchase these kits so you can facilitate the shift. Otherwise, the charcoal is very tempting. You're able to buy uh, a small bucket of charcoal to, to serve you through the day. So if you still have that on the market, then it's not so easy for you to go the harder way of looking for maybe $300 to buy a kit that you need to serve you. The long-term long benefits of, of, of shifting from charcoal and, and, and firewood are there are very big, including it's even cheaper in the long run, but making that shift is what is uh, not so easy. And we are encouraging financing institutions, even microfinances, to look at this as a potential area of uh, uh, providing soft loans. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would like to, uh, I, I mean, address the issue that I asked a little bit, uh, a little while ago. Uh, how can we get together as the Global South? And uh, what are the you know like uh, pointers that we need to take care of? If I can start with you, Sunor. I think in the previous session, the uh, speaker from the Rwanda Governance Board, um, she put it very clearly that all we need to do is to have the intent and start talking and start collaborating. Uh, this mention of we need more funds, we are always asking for more funds. Uh, but I think first we should look at optimization of what we already have. Um, because these funds come with strings, and these strings come with more uh, reporting, and we have a limitation of human resources. The other thing which I heard in the previous session, again mentioned by the same speaker, was the word corruption. So corruption is a word which in the development world we have started avoiding to such an extent that international agencies that are present in the global south in their reports, the word corruption does not even figure anymore. So you have transparency, misgovernance, but corruption is not there. When it comes to air pollution, we have a major problem with corruption, especially in terms of regulatory capture and how to avoid that. So we have countries uh, which are from the global south, which have very positive examples. So Bhutan has it in, in their constitution, 60% reservation for forest cover. 
and they managed to implement it. Rwanda is doing wonderful uh, things in terms of how they're doing it. Uh, Costa Rica has become a hub of innovation in sustainable energies. Mongolia, an, a landlocked country, has managed to address it by investing into isolation or insulation of the, of the housing. So there are many ways forward. Um, I think technical cooperation between experts who are not running talk shocks but are collaborating with each other on the science of issues is what can advance us quickly. Over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonor. Just a quick words, each of you, uh, because we're running out of time. We're already yeah, uh, past time. So let's, yeah, your, your last words. Okay, uh, just a quick one. Um, so what is ultimately needed uh, is for social movements, that's what I feel, to get behind combating air pollution because as highlighted by all the panel members, it's in, uh, it involves multi-sectoral collaboration and it's very complex. So including advocating and empowering our people to act at, at the individual level, including uh, securing finance to combat air pollution. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Awareness. Thank you. Yes. Um, Yes, so uh, I do agree that scientific collaboration is very, very key uh, to South-South uh, cooperation on air pollution, but also sharing of best practices, for mm -hmm. example, clean cooking, because, you know, this is one of the issues which a lot of Global South countries face. But also, since you mentioned the G20 presidency, uh, you know, India is, um, has taken a lifestyle for environment as one of the key driving themes um, across all the themes. So also individual behavior matters, some little things that we can do. But also this aspect of every department in government doing their bit. So there is a policy innovation called green budgeting. And in fact, we experimented this with two states uh, with, with really like nice results. You know, for example, even the police department said that, no, we can do better patrolling, you know, even in our civic responsibility on air pollution. So, so these are little things, you know, uh, but I do think it needs more dialogue and exchange, knowledge exchange amongst the Global South which we are having here perfectly. And last words, Juliet? Yeah, I think we need more than dialogue. We need uh, air, air quality stroke air pollution champions. It's a security issue, it's a health issue. We cannot just uh, look at it. I, I like the way everyone is uh, talking about climate change. Uh, we, we shouldn't forget about air quality, air pollution, and how leaders, each one of us, can play a very big role in turning the, this around, even starting with promoting green spaces in our neighborhoods. That goes a long way in filtering the, the air. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as you can see, change takes time. So we took a little more time uh, than was prescribed to us. But I would like you all to please join hands with me uh, to applaud our panelists who have wonderfully uh, shared their knowledge with us. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you guys later. Thank you.